and uh, his wife Sandy is here, and uh, they have two daughters, and she let me know very quickly we have six grandchildren, and so those of us who have grandchildren can appreciate that. I told someone the other day, I said, there's two people that always are two, I guess one's not people, but that always like you, seemingly, no matter what. One of them is grandchildren, the other is your dog. <laughs> you can come home no matter what kind of day you've had and what you've done. To them, they're just really happy to see you. I did tell someone here a while back to see which one loves you the most, your wife or your dog. I said, just lock both in the trunk for 30 minutes and then go back and unlock and see which one's really happy to see you. <laughs> and you will see which one. So you can mistreat your dog, but not your wife. Don't do that. Don't, don't try that. But uh, he's married, and we're certainly glad that Sandy is here uh, with him and with us then this week. He preaches at the uh, Science Hill Congregation in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. He also serves as one of the elders. He tells me they have five elders at that congregation, which I think is tremendous. That's great. He's been preaching the gospel for 41 years, so uh, some experience. Uh, and that, that goes a long way in a practical aspect. And he's going to be speaking to us today on purity and service. We're looking forward to it, Brother Nick. Glad you're here. Certainly a uh, privilege for me to be here and be a part of this great lectureship. Although I'm not a graduate of the school here, I've had much influence from people here. Throughout my years, I remember as uh, just a very young boy laying on a pallet listening to Brother Elkins preach when I was growing up. Brother Cates held several meetings in our area and other men, Brother Bland and others, that certainly have been a, a great influence for the cause of Christ here. I'm concerned about this lesson today. It's interesting to me because of this one fact. So many people get caught up in this idea that we're going to talk about today. You and I, as we consider Matthew 6 and verse 24, no man can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and he'll love the other. He'll hold of the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. As I think about that, I think about the number of individuals that have been destroyed because of choosing the wrong master. I think about the homes that have been destroyed in my lifetime because of choosing the wrong master, even congregations of the Lord's people that have chose the wrong master and end up in chaos. It's important today. You and I understanding that we must serve our God. You know what's unique about God? He expects us to serve Him everywhere or not serve Him anywhere. He expects us to be his children everywhere or not be them anywhere. And you and I have a responsibility to do that. As we think about the truths of this, here's what I want to try to do today. I want to try to look in Matthew 6 and gather some thoughts here that lead up to this verse. And I want to look at several examples in the Bible that you and I can look at today and begin to understand what happens or what the cost is when we fail to serve the wrong master. We have a great responsibility. You know, Paul, as he went to the church in Galatia, in Galatians 1 and verse 6 following, he, get, he found there that they were perverting the gospel of Christ. Certainly that was something that needs to be addressed, but he asks a great question in verse 10. Do we now seek to please God or to please man? You and I have to make that decision. We have to make it in a way that God will be pleased with, that we give him our service. We go back to Matthew 6, begin in verse 19. Scripture says there, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, 
where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I believe this writer, as we begin to understand here, we begin to see that our treasures and where we place our treasures and our emphasis in life can lead us in the wrong direction. You know, it's amazing about what we have and what God's blessed us with that those things can certainly destroy us. Matthew 16 and verse 24, the questions asked, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The answer to that is many things. Many things he will give and many things man has given in exchange for his soul. Now, I want to give you a practical application here. If you've preached the gospel or you worked in the Lord's church any period of time, you probably dealt with this same situation. You have a young couple that becomes part of the Lord's kingdom. They've been converted to Christ. They're excited about becoming Christians and being involved. But the time comes, they walk into the office, and in 40 years, this happened many occasions to me. They walk into the office and say, Brother Nichols, we got a dilemma we got a dilemma because next Lord's Day, we've got to decide, are we going to come to church or go to the kids' event? The, the coach has scheduled a baseball practice or there's a game or there's some kind of soccer practice that we've got to participate in. I've tried throughout all my lifetime to give the same standard answer. And I love sports. As a matter of fact, I'm coaching my grandson this year, and that's a great pleasure. I love sports from that standpoint, but I, I try to give the same standard answer as I give that answer. Come to worship and tell your child that it's the Lord's Day. We must worship God on the Lord's Day. You make the greatest difference in that child's life that could ever be made. You see, I think back when I was growing up, and maybe you can do this as well. I don't think about all the Sundays we just went to church. We just went. But I think about those times that we went and it was very difficult to go. There was something that was in the way. There's something that we could have very easily said, I want to do this instead of going to church. You and I have to decide which master we'll serve. And it's very difficult sometimes in the world. Here, I believe, is what's caused our biggest problem. Many times we let the world set our standard. We let the world set our standard instead of letting God set the standard for the world. It's very easy. Pretty soon, you know, that family says, well, you know, the the coach has said, if, if the child don't come, then he won't get to play. If he don't practice, he won't play. So we've got to go. And I wonder in my own mind, if we really stood for the master, if we really served the right master, if we would say, if he doesn't have anybody there to play, he won't be able to play the game. You and I fail sometimes to stand as we should. But the world has said we need to be well, children need to be well-rounded. We need to make sure that they're in all these other things, and, they, and there is some truth to that. But we need not let that determine which master we'll serve. I believe it's important that you and I, as we consider our life, we consider the master that we'll serve, that we make sure that we understand our priorities there. We get in Matthew chapter 19. Down in verse 16, there's a question that's asked. Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
Now that is a great question. If more people asked that question, we'd be gladly and willingly, we would answer that question. We would love to be able to lead people in the right way to be able to answer that question. But our Lord said, keep the commandments. He said, which one? He said, thou shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And I suggest to you in this verse of Scripture that you can almost see this young man smiling as he's being told what to do. But here's what I want us to grasp from Matthew 19 and this account. This young man, as he's giving this answer, and he answered, I've done all these things, he asked, what like I yet? You know, you and I today don't know each other like the Lord knows us, do we? We see what's outside. We see what's on the surface. We see what may look like a Christian and what may look like somebody serving the right master. But our Lord sees more than that. He sees what's inside a man, and that's what's really important. He says to the young man, go sell what you have and give it to the poor. Take up your cross and follow me. The young man went away sorrowful, for great were his possessions. There was something that stood between him and God, between him being able to choose the master that he needed able to choose. You know, he'd done so many things good in keeping the law. He'd been so good in what he was doing, but he had failed to do the thing that the Lord saw he needed to do. You know, I think about Cornelius. I think about Cornelius in Acts 10, and we see a man here, a Gentile, that he even found favor among the Jews before he was converted. But yet he was lost. He was a good man. This young man in Matthew 19 seems to be a very good man, yet there was something between him and God. Now, I don't believe today that you and I would say that riches were the problem. I don't think riches was the young man's problem here. The problem was that those things got between him and God. It's not sports that I talked about that's the problem. It's when we let those things get between us and God. It's not the things that we might enjoy in this life that would be a problem. It's not those things that would cause us a problem, but when those things get between us and God, then it becomes a problem and can cause us to follow the wrong master, to serve the wrong master. I think about that young man and just one thing, just one thing in his life that wasn't right, one thing that God saw he needed to do, and he couldn't do that. What about me? What, what would I have if I were asked a question and I were at, would I be able to be pleasing unto God? Would I be able to serve the right master? Uh, certainly the challenge that we have today. You and I must serve the right master. It's not always easy in the world we live in. Is it? We live in a world that pulls from many angles. First Peter 5 and verse 8, Peter says, Satan's as a roaring lion seeking those whom he'll devour, trying to pull them away. Although it... I must give my whole heart and serve God everywhere and make Him my master. Satan can tempt me in one area, get me to fall away in one area and cause me to go in the wrong direction. I need to be very careful when I think about this master that I would serve. How am I serving Him and am I putting Him first in my life? You see, if we go on in Matthew 6 and we get in verse 33, the scripture tells us there, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, putting him first in everything that we do. I should consider 
when I began to make plans and I began to look at what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it, how does God fit into this plan? How does God fit into what I'm going to do? Is He the one that I'm really centering upon or is it on my own will and ideas that I'm truly thinking about? I need to serve the right master. It's tragic today. It's tragic today in many areas. And I mention individuals, I mention homes, and I mention congregations of God's people that would let the wrong master be the Lord of their life. You know, sometimes we seek out things and we ask for advice and we look in different directions. And you and I want to be able to find what will help us to be able to put God first in our life. I know this is a time of vacations coming up. It's a time that we plan for the year. We, we begin to look at a lot of things. Where does God fit into that? Would certainly be a question I should always ask. Am I putting him in the right spot? Sometimes it happens this way. I do everything that I want to do, and I just feel God into what's left over. God intends to be first in our life. A priority we must hold to. As young people, we must understand this principle. You and I understanding that God should come first in our life. You now we get in Luke 12. Here's an interesting individual. We get down in verse 16, and this parable is given. A certain man's uh, Land, his fruit was brought forth plentiful. He, he had more than he knew what to do with. He had more than he ever imagined that he'd have, and somehow he began to think that it was his. And, and isn't that like us sometimes? You know, I'm blessed, and I believe sometimes maybe our blessings are our biggest cursings. And sometimes we're blessed in such a way that I say, well, look at what I've got, and look at what I've done. And look at how I can do these things. In all reality, God has provided those things that I have. This man failed to realize that as he looked at his crops. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I've got more stuff than I've got room. I don't know where I'll store all this stuff. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And I'll say to my soul, now here, listen carefully. Eat, drink, and be merry, for thou hast much goods laid up for many days. That's what he said. That's what he said to his soul. You got many goods laid up for many days. We don't have nothing to worry about. We've got more than we can ever use. We're blessed abundantly. But God said, there's a difference there. The man said, we got plenty. God said, Thou fool, tonight thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be that you talk about and you have here? Whose really are these things? Your soul is going to be required. You know, when I go through this world, I, I know sometimes I visit the schools and as I go to the school, it's not uncommon. People say, well, I want to be a fireman or I want to be a policeman or I want to be this or that. And, and they begin to name all of those things that they want to be and, and to begin to think about. But you and I, as we think about being a Christian, being what we need to be and being what God would have us to be is the greatest privilege and blessing that we can ever have in this life blessings come to us understanding that God is our master he's the one that leads us we're going to serve him and put him number one in our life are we willing to do that well certainly this man as he realized everything that he had can that harm us in this life can it harm us to be blessed abundantly I'm afraid sometimes that it does you know, we, I guess as we get older, Brother Land, we make statements like this, but we look and say, 
You know, I worked and worked and worked and was able finally to obtain these things. And maybe our children want those things as soon as they get married. They want them from the beginning. And you and I, as we begin to think about that, we have to understand where those things come from and the work that goes into getting them. But the main thing we have to understand is we don't let those things get between us and God. If those things get between us and God, they can destroy us. They can lead us in the wrong direction. So our master in life is very important. It's very important for you and I to understand that we must put him first in our life. We must not let anything get in the way of that. That may be in a marriage relationship, a man's responsibility as we begin to think, I take charge in that we're not going to let anything in our marriage get in the way of us serving God. In our family, we're not going to let anything get in the way of serving our God. I have a farm, and I have some cows and goats, and my wife has peacocks. But we've got a lot of animals on the farm, and, and always trying to trap the preacher, you see. Somebody says, well, what are you going to do on Sunday morning if all your cows are out? So I say, I guess it'll be okay to worship's over. And then I'll try to get them back in. That's the importance of our priorities. Now, I'm not trying to be foolish in that. I'm just trying to say you and I need to set some priorities when it comes to serving our God. Are we willing to do that? And sometimes we're just simply not willing to pay the price. Christianity demands, serving our God demands that he be first in all things. Deciding which master I'll serve. I can't serve two masters. Maybe that's the most miserable person we could ever meet. That person that tries to pretend that as they come to church and come to worship and go about living their life that they're living for God, but all along they're not. And, and they're being pulled in this direction and pulled in that direction. And it has to be a miserable feeling to not have God as a master of your life. Let's think about this word service for just a minute. This word service is so important to you and I. As we think about service and we think about what we need to do, let me make this simple statement. The very highest office that a man can ever obtain in this world is that of a servant. We can't get any higher than that. If you and I can understand that in our life, we'll understand the beauty of it. Let's look at our Lord in John, the 13th chapter. We see there in that chapter, when his disciples came together, he began to wash their feet. He began to wash their feet, even to such an extent that Peter said, Lord, I, I'm not going to let you wash my feet. I have need that I wash your feet. And the, our Lord said, if I don't wash your feet, then you'll have no part with me. Peter said, not only my feet, but my head. I'll also wash everything, if that's what it means. But as Jesus gets through with that, he wasn't trying to teach us that we are to go wash other people's feet. That's not the lesson there. He says, go ye and do likewise. Go serve other people. Learn what it means to be a servant. Learn what it means to give of ourselves, as we think from that standpoint. You know, I, I love 2 Corinthians 8 chapter when we look at the Macedonians. Here in a nutshell is really what we're trying to say today. In 2 Corinthians 8 chapter, the Macedonians, Paul said this they did, not as we asked, but first they gave their own selves. That's the key, isn't it? That's the key as you and I begin to think about this, is giving ourselves. Now, let me make rather a strange statement right here maybe. I believe sometimes people are in the Lord's church for years and years and years before they decide to give themselves, before they decide to really 
let the Lord be the, the master that they'll serve. To really put Him first in their life, it, it takes sometimes lots of years to be able to do that. But you and I, as we think about these Macedonians, they were willing to give their selves. What does God really require of us? To give of ourselves, doesn't He? He requires me to give of all myself, to give of all that I can do, my talents, whatever that might be. But I need to give myself. Jesus washed these disciples' feet, not to, I realize that was a custom of the day, but not to teach any other lesson other than you and I learning to be servants of God. And which master will we serve? When we think about this word servanthood, it's very important. It's very important for you and I to understand it in depth. We get in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 1 beginning, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, he says. Your reasonable service. What is our reasonable? Presenting this body, our sacrifice, being willing to give of ourselves, being able to make sure that we do and place our priorities in the right place. But he also gives a little warning there in verse 2 when he says, be not conformed to this world. Now, Every time I read that verse of Scripture, I, I think and picture this in my mind. I think about a, a potter that's making pottery, and, and he's forming that to, to be whatever he wants it to be. Paul said, don't let this world form you into what you, it would have you to be. Don't let it pull you into what it would have you to be, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to understand the importance there. Don't be conformed to the world. Don't let the world lead us in the wrong, don't go the wrong way. What does that really mean to me? Well, my friends began to say, and, and people have asked me this, you mean you really go to church four hours a week? Wow, that's unbelievable. Friend told me just last week, said we we've got a new idea going on. We we go on Saturday night and we get it over with. And I thought that rather strange. But I remember one time when I'd preached my one of my very first sermons some forty years ago. I was standing as the men did oftentimes outside the building at that time, waiting to go in. Even sometimes the singing would start before the men got in. And as we were standing in that circle, one of the brothers said, well, let's go in there and get this over with. And I thought, is that really what we're doing? Is that really the thought that we do when we worship and serve our God? Is that our Christian life? Let's just get this over with. We need to know and understand wherein I am serving and what master I have. I hope today as we think about serving our God, putting Him first in our life, letting Him lead us in the right direction, that we'll do that. You know what I believe today? That some of the greatest preachers that have ever been born into this world have never preached. I believe some of the greatest elders that have ever been born into this world have never shepherded the flock because they've never been willing to submit themselves and give themselves to God. So what a blessing it would have been, what a waste it is when it's, our talent is not used. We realize as we look at those talents in Matthew 25 that whatever I have are to use for my master, are to be willing to give that, are to be willing to use of that in my life. And if I'm not, then I won't be blessed for it. And you and I need to put our best foot forward when we think about service. But 
There's one more example I want to look at. And it comes from Luke 16. You know this scripture very well, beginning in verse 19. Here's a rich man and Lazarus. The scripture says a rich man was dressed in silk and purple and fine linen. He, he fared sumptuously every day. Uh, there, he was just doing great. He, he had everything seemingly that he needed but Lazarus. Poor Lazarus. Lazarus had to eat of the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And the dogs came and licked his sores. What, what a, a sad sight to think about. These two men living in the world, but they died and the rich man found himself in a completely different situation. You see, in this world, he'd had everything he wanted. What would that be today? I, I, I know sometimes I may go to lunch with somebody and, and people may say, well, you know, I got this CD and that CD and the stock market's doing this or that. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty well set for life. But what about your soul? What about that part of it? And sometimes we fail to see that. But here was this rich man. Seemingly he had in the world everything that he ever wanted. What would it take today in this world to make you happy? What would it take for us to be the kind of people that we would just be filled with joy every day? Well, this rich man seemed to be in that position. He seemed to be in a position that he was really faring good. But there's something that happened. And it happens according to Hebrews 9 and verse 27. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. When that man died, he understood a, a reality that you and I need to understand this side of the day of judgment. He understood that the things he had weren't the things he needed to bring him eternal life. And when he was in torment in those flames, wanting Lazarus to just bring a little, little bit of water to be able to cool him with, he must have realized that I should have done things different. And as he begins to want to Go tell his brethren, he's told there's a great gulf here. You can't cross that gulf. You can't go back over, and neither can anybody come to you. So now it's over. It's fixed. And you and I, when we live this life, and we, we decide which servant we'll serve, if we've not done that well, we find ourselves exactly where this rich man is. Now you and I consider Luke 16 and this uh, Hadean world that, that we see here. We, we realize that now this rich man realizes that he's going to have to face God and spend eternity in torment because he chose the wrong master. But Lazarus lived horribly here and there was now a time that he could find relief and comfort. He could find the things that he wanted and those things that really paid off. You know, we began to look and James says man's life is like a vapor and it appears for just a little while and then it's gone. And while we're here, if we don't choose the right master, when we leave this world, we find ourselves faced with the exact same thing that the rich man's faced with here. We find as we look at this place and we think about Tartarus, this place for these evil spirits, ungodly people here, that, that he finds himself in that state because in this world he chose the wrong master. The Bible is full today of lessons that you and I can gather from the, the Scripture to help us understand the importance of the Master, but seemingly it's hard to get the point across. I want to fast forward a little bit with a thought I had a while ago. That young couple comes in and I say, you make the biggest decision you've ever made and, and tell them that you have to go to worship on the Lord's Day 
That'll be the biggest impact they've ever had in their life. But you know what? I'm sad to say today that the odds are against that happening, especially in my experience. What usually happens, they go on to the practice, they go on to the game, and pretty soon Satan's got a grip on them, pulls them in, and some five, six, ten years later, they're back in the office. Now, here's a question this day, and this is real. I'm not giving you anything out of a fiction book. This is real. They come back in and say, Brother Nichols, we've tried, but where did we go wrong with our children? Well, you remember? You remember six years ago when we sat here? You remember where that led you after you left? Now, my children don't even go to church. They don't even believe in God. And that's where Satan leads us. And brethren, if you think that can't happen, we're fooling ourselves because the Bible and life is full of experiences to tell us just that. What will we do when we choose our master? Are we going to choose the master that will lead us to a beautiful home in heaven? A place that we can enjoy throughout all eternity. Not only that, we can live the most beautiful life here. You know, I, I think it interesting, and I get to Acts 8 and see Philip there as he goes and joins himself to the eunuch. He teaches that man about the truth. He teaches him what he needs to, to know to become a Christian. He, the man says, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you mayest. They went down into the water and he baptized him, but, but here's what I want us to get. The man went on his way rejoicing. The Christian life, putting our master first, is a life of rejoicing. But in this world, if I don't make that decision, that I'm pulled on each direction. I'm pulled in each direction to such an extent that it makes me sometimes miserable. I need to make sure which master I'll serve. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Now, somewhere in our mind, we think I'm stronger than that. I'm stronger than that. And you know, some days when I visit people, and usually on Monday, I, I make an a extra effort to go visit people. And by the way, I'll say this, that you know, Sometimes on Monday, that I find out that there's been an epidemic on Sunday. But people are miraculously okay on Monday. And I don't know if you find that as well, but it happens. But when I go to visit people and I go to talk to people and, and begin to try to, well, people say we, we've got so much going on. man told me last week and his family's been in the church all my life. He said, you know, I, I only get off, now I, I was amazed at this, I only get off on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And those are my days. I'm not going to let anything get in that. Well, the rich man didn't either, I suppose. And you and I, when we begin to think about eternity and what we have to face, we realize the difficulty that lies ahead of us. What we're going to have to deal with if we don't serve the right master. Somebody says, well, it's difficult being a Christian. I remember one time a man was holding a meeting in our area and he was talking about Christian principles. This lady pulled me aside after the service and said, Brother Nichols, I can't live this way. I can't live within all those things that he's talking about. And I reminded her that Paul said, I suppose that the things that I endure here, the things that I go through here, do not compare what awaits me in heaven. What would I have to do that would be worthy enough or I would have to work hard enough that would be worth heaven? Nothing could be any more important than that. So I leave you with this thought today. I leave you with this idea of thinking that 
as you and I, regardless of how long we've been in church, regardless of how long that we've been a Christian, that we consider our master and make sure that God is the Lord of our life and he's leading us in the right direction. You've been so good this evening giving me your attention. I appreciate that very much. Thank you for your time. Well, I tell you what.